no one is wise enough to create everything anew in, in a single generation. Hey there, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And we're the traditional martial arts podcast that comes to you twice a week with different episodes, different people, different topics. And today we have noted martial arts scholar and author, Sifu Jonathan Bluestein. If you're new to the show, you may not know my voice. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I'm your host on Martial Arts Radio. I have the best job in the world because I get to talk about martial arts with some of the world's most amazing people. If you want to check out the products we make, head on over to whistlekick.com. You can find shirts and other stuff like that for traditional martial artists, gear, training aids, and links to all of the other amazing projects we've got going, like Martial Journal, Martial Arts Calendar, and honestly, too many to name in an intro segment. It'd get really annoying if I went down the whole list. But check out whistlekick.com. You can see all the stuff we got going on there. As I said, our guest today is Sifu Jonathan Bluestein. Although he's from Israel, he's knowledgeable about Chinese culture and Chinese martial arts, and that's just one of the many reasons that he's on the show today. While many of us have dreamed of traveling to the homeland of martial arts for training, he's done it. Shifu Bluestein talks about not only his love for martial arts, but the ways his kung fu has impacted every aspect of his life, all the way down to gardening. Let's hear from him. Hey, Sifu Bluestein, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic today. It's sunny. It's springtime in Israel. I'm working a lot in my garden, and it's just wonderful. Oh, cool. Awesome. What do you garden? What do you grow? Uh, fruits, vegetables. I got a mango tree, an olive tree, a uh, pitango, uh, sure, a very nice tropical fruit. Um, tomatoes cucumbers squash whatnot wow you, you've got that that is quite the garden it's more more than just a couple things on the patio oh sure sure uh, it's a small place uh but gardening is medicine and uh, in a way it's intimately related to the martial arts in fact um there's a very nice video on youtube somewhere showing uh the relationship between farming and one of the arts that i practice and teach shinny train oh so, cool um, yeah, because these uh, these farmers in uh, ancient and, and also not so ancient China um, borrowed a lot of movement concepts from their farming and uh, delivered them into their martial arts, uh, both in, in application and training methods. Um, and th that makes a lot of sense, because if you are a farmer and you have to work with manual tools and... Mostly, they didn't have any sophisticated technology up, up until very recently. So you have to, say, plow the field for hours and hours a day and pull that drives. And that's very hard work. And if you're going to do this for many hours on end, then you got to find a way that's not so tiring. you got to use your body as a single unit uh, so you wouldn't uh, waste too much power. And also be able to generate a lot of power for various movements, whether you want to pull out a root or you want to move something that's heavy. And unlike with, say, a deadlift at a gym, where you come and, and the, uh, the exercise, exercise itself is the goal, right? You want to build your muscle. You want to build your strength. So you're going to strain yourself for the, just those 10, 20, 30, maybe 60 seconds, and that's it. And then you're going to have a rest. And you're going to try again. Then in 45 minutes to maybe an hour, you're done. And then you get a day or two of rest and you, then you can go at it again. That's very different than having to generate power and do so continuously for hours. So you got to work with your body differently. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when we think about a lot of martial traditions, they do tend to come out of farming communities, you know. Right. A lot of folks listening that are familiar with Okinawan martial arts, you know, whenever we think of the stereotypical Okinawan martial arts practice, it, it's family lineage and it's farmers. Yeah, that's very true. And also, uh, we got to get into the mindset of these farmers. Who are they? They're people who are, they're community based. They can't, there is individualism, of course, in any society, e even in a dictatorship, there is some form of individualism. However, um, you are codependent. 
you can't just pick a fight with anyone. And nowadays, we, we have our democracies, uh, so-called. <laughs> not so much in some <laughs> we are, respects. We are not going down that rabbit hole today, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, and we, with our democracies, we can just go online and, and take a piss at anyone uh, and, and be nasty towards uh, anyone we, we wish to. We, we can even at times uh, be not so kind towards people who are our acquaintances, maybe even our friends in the name of truth and criticism and all that. But if you live in a farming community and you know that you're going to piss someone off, maybe you're going to have a fight, and then the next day, uh, maybe both of you are bruised and can't work and you're not going to have food, then it's a lose-lose situation. Or maybe you need to work together in the field and he's not going to work with you. That's also a lose-lose situation. So if you live in such a community, um, there is a different perspective to things. And this brings forth a different perspective in Okinawan and Chinese martial arts uh, than it is maybe in, in some Western martial arts because they're community-based. And, and you see that, you know, some people, they might look at this from the outside if they don't practice these arts or they don't like what they do. And they say, oh, this is like, uh, this is a, a socialist mindset or something like that. This is... Uh, not something I would like to, to get into or like to do, but not at all. I mean, th these people didn't create their stuff because they're influenced by Karl Marx. Uh, they, they're more community oriented because of uh, historical necessity and still proves very effective in uh, traditional martial arts communities to this day. Hmm. That's really interesting stuff. Now, you alluded to some things as you were just talking that make a great transition into why we've brought you on the show You've spent a considerable amount of time and, and have some expertise, I guess, is, is really the word, on training in China. And, and even, I think we can take a step back from the specifics of training in China and talk about training elsewhere, you know, destination training, uh, going to the, the home of your arts, if you want to look at it that way. And I'd love for us to talk some more about that, about what people can expect why people would want to go there. Um, so really, we just kind of had a good primer, completely unplanned listeners. We, we weren't planning to talk about gardening at all, but, <laughs> you know, here we see yet again, the martial arts is everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and going back to gardening for just two seconds, yeah, um, I, I use my martial arts and gardening all the time. I mean, if you work at gardening, you find out very quickly that your martial arts stances and the way you use your body as a unified whole is very useful and effective for a whole lot of things, especially if you have to dig things out the ground or dig into the ground. That's very useful. So um, you said I'm an expert on training in China. Maybe I'm an expert on Chinese martial arts, but I have not spent enough time of my life to be considered like a Chinese cultural as aspect, even though I'm very familiar with it. And I'm saying this because Chinese culture is very, very different to ours, Westerners. And to really gain serious expertise in that kind of cultural setting, maybe someone ought to spend uh, a number of years, five, seven years in China and speak fluent Chinese um, to to get the grips of it. Uh, I, I was there for less, uh, though still for a considerable amount of time. So first of all, what brings me to China, I practice and teach um, free traditional Chinese martial arts. They are Xing Yichun, uh, Xing Yichun and Pi Guazhang, Pi Guazhang, that come from Northern China, and also uh, Southern Mantis of the Joklum lineage, who comes, which comes from uh, Southern China. Now, uh, my teacher here in Israel, Shifu Nisan Oren, has studied in the city of Tianjin in China for many years. Um, the city of Tianjin it has been a um, central location in China for centuries. It had, it had even been um, the capital city of China for, for a while. Um, and it's a major, major center for commerce, innovation, trade, um, culture, you name it. There are over 15 million people living there. So it, it, it's the size of many small countries. It's actually, my country of Israel is um, smaller in population size than the city of Tianjin. And nowadays it's very advanced. Um, 
some people who haven't been to China or who, who perhaps have seen images of you know the countryside and places like that, they take China to be a backward place at times. But actually, if you go to Tianjin, in some respects, it's as advanced or even more advanced than New York City, because you take a city like like New York, uh, and and it's old in its infrastructure, relatively speaking. The amount of new construction taking place is not that large. However, in China, what the government can do uh, with the type of uh, power it has over the country and over its citizens, if it wants to build something new, it just flattens several neighborhoods and build a whole section of the city anew. So if they build something new, it's big and it's going to be the newest thing that technology and money can afford. And they spare no expense. So when I went there in last in 2014, uh, the new subway just opened. They already had a subway for a long while. And I went down that subway and didn't ha- even have currency. They had this like... Um, plastic coin system, which was very innovative. And then you went down the subway and you were traveling underground. And of course, you can see anything through the windows. So the windows turned into 3D hologram advertisements, the likes of which I have not seen in subways and trains elsewhere in the world. And I'm, I'm quite well traveled. So uh, that just gives you an example of how advanced some of the things uh, they have are. Wow. So uh, I got to Tianjin to study with my shugong, my, my teacher's teacher. His name is Master Zhou Jingxuan. Uh, he's recently deceased. He sadly passed away two years ago from complications of a stroke. And Master Zhou had lived and studied and trained and taught in the city of Tianjin uh, all his life. He also uh, came to Israel for a month-long seminar and he lived in my house. That's how I get to know him personally. And then I, I travel to study with him in Tianjin. So that's what got me there. And I like many other people who go to China and they're not quite sure what they're going to study, who they're going to study with, whether they're going to be at the temple or elsewhere or anything like that. I I knew from the get-go because of my teacher that I'm going to see his teacher. It's going to be in a city where I'm going to see him, etc. So the path was clearer for me. And uh, Master Joe used to teach in at Shigu Park. Shigu Park is a very big, nice-looking park, uh, and at the center of Tianjin, and it's a meeting ground for a whole lot of martial artists of different styles. And he'd been training there in other parts since the age of nine, and had studied with many teachers and taught several martial arts, and was really a martial arts prodigy. So uh, that's that's what brought me to to China. Cool. And uh, do, would you like to ask something? Yeah, let's yeah, yeah. Talk. Let's. So we're we're kind of going to go in in I think two parallel tracks here as we talk about this. We're going to talk about your specific journey, why you went to China, and and things that happened there. But I'd also like us to kind of back out some general knowledge for folks that are listening, because mm-hmm. you know there 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 may be some folks listening who train in. Your styles are similar styles that might want to go to the same places and have a similar trip. But I'm going to guess that most of the listeners are not. And they're going to be interested in, okay, what would it be like? What things should I consider if I'm going to go to Japan or to the Philippines or, you know, wherever the the recognized home of the art or arts that they practice and and what to expect and what their mindset should be. You know, there's culture shock, I think, whenever we go from one place to another. But what makes that hardest is expectations. So I, I want to I go back e- even more. What, you know, we talked about, I guess, the, the very general why you went to train with specific people. But what was it about your training that made you want to seek those folks out? Okay, so just several questions here, and I'll give you several yeah, answers. Yeah, please. Uh, first of all, if anyone wishes to, to train abroad or just train out of where they're living, I think the, the first thing to be aware of is what do you want to study and who do you want to study with? So I'll give you two examples. Um, first, if you don't know what you want to study, uh, there was one Israeli guy, he went to uh, Master Joe in China, my teacher's teacher, and he kind of didn't quite 
figure out what he wants to study. So he came to Master Joe and he told him, you know, I want to study your Shinyi trend. Master Joe said, okay, uh, so what do you want to study with the Shinyi trend? And he said, everything. I just want to study everything. And Master Joe asked him, okay, how, how, how much time you got? He said, two and a half months. I said, okay, you got two and a half months. I'll give you everything I can. Because a, a lot of traditional Chinese teachers, what they believe is, uh, I'm just going to give you what you ask for. It's it's a thing in China, in Chinese culture. Um, a lot of people, they, they're not... If you want something badly, then the, a Chinese person would often assume that you have good judgment, even if your request is ridiculous. If in, even if your request is not what he thinks is right, he would respect your opinion and your judgment. Unlike perhaps in the United States or in Israel or in Europe, or, you know, so, take the restaurant example, okay? Um, maybe... Uh, you want to take something out of a dish, you know, you, you think you wouldn't like one agree- ingredient. So uh, in China, if, if they even agree to to your request, then they just say, okay, they'll they take it out and they'll give you what you ask for. It, it's more likely than not, even if they agree, because often they don't like to, to change the, the way the dishes are structured. But, it, you know, in the West, if you're in the United States or Europe or Israel, then it's it's very common for the way they tell you, oh, you know, but this ingredient, it's, it's really good tasting. Maybe you'd like it. Maybe um, it, it makes the dish better. Maybe you should give it a go. So they actually try to bargain it with you and, and they sort of slightly in a very gentle way argue with you over it. So that's something a Chinese person, traditionalist Chinese person, would often not do. So that guy came to Master Joe. He told him, I want to study everything in two and a half months. He said, okay. And he taught him most of the curriculum in two and a half months. The guy trained, trained, trained. And he's um, he's gifted movement-wise. And he had a lot of experience with martial arts prior. So when he taught him the movements, he he kind of got the movements. But it's all empty because you got to build up your basics. And that takes years. And you can't just throw the curriculum at someone. He can be maybe... Uh, a most excellent ballet dancer so he can take in all the movements doesn't mean that he has the art he just has empty movements and he would forget most of it mm-hmm. and that's what happened the guy came back to israel forgot most of what he had learned uh, figured out that actually he hasn't he hasn't gotten the, gotten the basics so he went to my teacher and asked him to teach him the basics from the very beginning and very slowly this time and he had the most wonderful experience in china training and all but he wasted his time essentially because he could have focused on far fewer things and got them done right than studying the whole curriculum and getting next to nothing. Mm. So that's why it's very important to know what you want to study. And you also want to know who you want to study with. And you want to figure this out before you make your travels because otherwise you can be taken advantage of. Think of a tourist uh, in your country, whichever country the listener is from, Anyone who's a tourist can easily fall into into a financial trap or can be easily lied to because they don't know the culture and, and the environmental setting. It, it's very common, you know, to see newly immigrated people fall victim to all sorts of, um, you know, financial schemes and cons and, and whatever. Um, it's, it's the same for you. Don't, don't think you can't fall for it. Because if you're a Westerner and you come into Japan or China or the Philippines or whatever, if you don't know the people and you don't know the culture, then you can be easily manipulated by people to believe that what they're selling you is authentic, it's legit, it's what you want, and then spend anywhere between a week to several years doing something that's just wasting your time. And, mm. and you wouldn't be able to figure it out quickly unless someone else tells you that or you know oftentimes people would just think oh it's just what he wants you know so no one would say anything and then suddenly you waste the five years of your life with a teacher who's selling you uh, a so-called lesser product not that martial arts you know i don't like to think of martial arts as a business or a product but as an analogy and uh, then you you figure out whatever you had studied with five years of training, you could have gotten three months with another teacher who's far more skilled and who, who also you, you like better personally on the personal level. Sure. So let's go back because you, you gave the example of the individual who went to China and, and really didn't get what he had wanted, didn't come back with, I, I guess we could say didn't come back with knowledge. He had experiences, but didn't retain that information. Is it, fa- is it fair to say that you are 
discouraging folks from learning the the basics of an art in travel that they should have a foundation and that it is to improve the art that you would travel and train with with folks i would say this um if you are a complete beginner at a certain martial art and you wish to travel abroad then do so for a very minimum of three months and it's better if you can stay for at least two years that's best if you are a complete beginner you don't know anything or next to nothing about a certain martial arts you a certain martial art you want to study but otherwise if you already have the basics nailed down you've been practicing for a while and they're a qualified teacher and you're going to study with someone who's associated affiliated with your teacher or and teaches something that's similar and you've been training for a while, then maybe you can go for as little as maybe two or three weeks. That would also be a, a useful period of time for training for you. But especially if you're going to train for a shorter period of time, it's very important that you do so intensely, that you practice for several hours a day, because if you've already traveled and, and, and spent so much money and effort and time on this, then at least you know, push yourself to train a, a bare minimum of two or three hours a day so you can um, get the most you want out of that experience as a, and ask as many questions as you can. And also, it's very good, if, if possible, uh, if if it's allowed, to take as many pictures and videos as, as you can to take back with you to reflect upon once you're back in your homeland. And all of these things would be very helpful. I see a lot of people, they come to China, they have this fantasy, um, they train half an hour, an hour a day, and the rest of the day just go about eating good food and uh, visiting tourist attractions, which is makes for fantastic experiences, but you came for the martial arts, right? So, you know, go for it. That's a great delineation, and, and I like the words that we're using here, an experience, a travel experience, a vacation, I guess some would call it, that has <laughs> some training component versus I'm going to go, I'm going to study. It's, it's an intensive experience. I, I can't speak to other parts of the world, but I know here in the U S I have a number of friends who have been on intensive academic tours. You know, they, they go to Peru and, and live there for two weeks, speaking nothing but Spanish in an effort to learn Spanish or to, you know, to travel to other cultural centers to invest that time to come away with some some well-founded knowledge. And I guess if we're going to look at martial arts travel in the same way, you really have to jump in with both feet and invest as much of the time as possible into taking those experiences away, as you're saying. So that makes a lot of sense, but admittedly, it wasn't something I'd considered when we started talking about it. I've always had this dream of, you know, going to, to Japan or to Okinawa and spending a couple weeks there and maybe training two or three times in a week as I would here. But I'm realizing now that that's not really worth all of that investment. Maybe I'll have some fun. Maybe I'll meet some people. But if I want to learn as much as I can, that has to be the top priority. Yeah. Another um, aspect to be taken into account here is that Asian peoples, in my experience, often are not so quick to trust as uh, Western peoples. Because, um, I know, perhaps it's assumed in a Judeo-Christian culture that we come from the same foundations, especially among Jews. You know, if, if you, I, I'm, I'm a Jewish Israeli, if you meet another Jew, they just... Uh, randomly expect you to be a part of their extended family most often but in asia um you have to establish something called guanxi in chinese guanxi literally translates as relationship so it's a relationship of trust and it's created when one side in the relationship um provides uh, a favor for the other side a favor can be uh, something you do for someone or a small gift or just being forthcoming in in a very specific way so let's say um i'm on the street and i seem baffled i don't know where to go and some chinese guy sees me 
and he's been interested in uh, getting becoming friends with some Western people because he maybe he needs to improve his English, maybe business wise he needs some connections with uh, Western individuals, which are difficult to get sometimes if you're native Chinese and you don't speak English well. So he sees me all baffled on the street, and he comes to me, and he helps me out. Uh, he's been very kind. And he doesn't ask for anything in return, and he would show me the way, and maybe he even, it's very uh, common in China, he would even take me where I need to go. Uh, and then in the end, we, we talk a little bit, maybe for five minutes, and he gives me his business card, and I give him mine. And then he kind of knows in the cultural context that he lives in, that now we sort of have Guanxi, that relationship, that now he has my business card, maybe um, a week later, uh, he would like to meet with some uh, British guy. And he needs to explain something to that British guy that he cannot co- quite put into words in English. So he knows that maybe he can give me a call and I would explain it to that British guy for him. Because now I kind of owe him a favor in that relationship, in that guanxi. And, and now that we have exchanged two favors, he gave me one, I gave him one. Now... And the relationship is strengthened. And now maybe if we want to, we can become friends. We are more trusting. Eventually, uh, these favor exchanges can, can get pretty serious. For instance, people who have strong guanxi with each other, and maybe um, one, one person ha- has a daughter and his daughter needs to get into university, but she doesn't have good enough grades. His friend, uh, with whom he'd had guanxi since they were kids, a, is the, a professor at that university. It's expected of his friend, the professor, to pull some string, get the, the guy's daughter into the university, even if uh, it's sort of illegal, even if she doesn't have the best of grades, because they have guanxi, and in China, oftentimes, guanxi triumphs over a lot. It triumphs over most things, um, because the power of relationships is very strong. But to set up that relationship, that takes time. That can take days, weeks, months, also, uh, oftentimes, if you go to a traditionalist teacher in China or Okinawa, especially in Japan too, it's very different if you just enter the school, enter the dojo, and you say, here I am, I want to train. So say, fine. Then maybe it takes you months to, to get into their guanxi and, and be trusted. But if you come with a letter of recommendation from someone they have guanxi with already, maybe it's someone uh, they knew for many years, maybe it's one of their Kung Fu brothers, uh, some per person who trained with them under the same teacher. People like that could be even their neighbor whom they've known for 10 years. Um, any, but m- more, uh, more, more likely, uh, better would be to, to have someone from the martial arts family you come with a letter like that, or even better, if that person brings you and attests to your good character, um, this is a prime entry ticket. This is much better than just coming in, because it's not. It's not. It, this, a school might be commercial, but it doesn't mean that because you have the money and you can pay, and they're going to teach you that you're not going to have that guanxi, that relationship that has to be built. But you can bypass that if someone introduces you then this is very powerful. So this is also very good for consideration. Um, If you're going to see a teacher, and he's a traditionalist teacher in the East, to have an introduction by someone is very important, and it's it's going to save you time and the money, and that teacher is going to take you far more seriously. Imagine you have a childhood friend you knew for 30 years. You, you met the guy almost every day for 10 years, then you kept in touch for 20 years. You trust him completely. M- maybe he's the godfather of your children even. And then that person tells you, oh, you know, I have this guy. I really like him. He's bright. He's dedicated. This guy can study with you. I'm sending him your way. Please take care of him. So you're, take- you're going to take this seriously. More seriously than if someone just comes off the street and says, I want to train today. Say, oh, okay, fine. Maybe he comes, maybe he comes back or not. And maybe he pays, maybe he doesn't. I don't know how serious he is. Very different. Mm. Interesting. This is all now, great stuff. And, I, and I, I'm sure that just as you're doing so with me, some of the listeners are, are kind of having their perceptions blown up. And that's why, you know, we had talked about 
what we were going to talk about today, and that's why I'm glad we settled on this, because I think a lot of times, and, and I've talked to people who've done this, people will go and they'll go somewhere to train and, and they don't get what they were hoping for. So the, the goal here today, listeners, is to give you some things to think about so you can better plan out any kind of international destination training, or honestly, e even domestically, you're training, you know, going anywhere to train on a temporary basis carries some pitfalls with it. If you think back to the first time you went to train somewhere, maybe that, I'm, I'm assuming that was China. Yes. What expectations did you have that didn't pan out? What um, myths, I guess, can we blow up for people? Well, just about everything. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a long list. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell, tell you why. If a culture is very different to ours, what, what are your expectations built upon? I mean, you've seen some movies, you've read some books, maybe you, you've heard some stories. You never really get it until you get there, until you, you physically land in the place when you, you see the people. You smell the smells, you see, you, you view the sights, you can, you can touch everything. Everything is different, especially in China. You're like an alien. Um, I mean, when I was in the city of Tianjin, or maybe now it's a bit different, um, that you could walk for an entire day in that city and not see another Caucasian. Not a single person. And not only that, it's not only that there are no Caucasians around, and I'm, I'm, I don't mind it racially or ethnically or, or at all. I like the Chinese people a lot. It's just that you're you're like an, an alien among them because you're the only person who looks like you do. And then on top of that, there is barely anyone in the entire city who can speak your language. Hebrew, forget about it, of course. And English, well, you'd be hard-pressed to, to find any Chinese person uh, who can converse more than three or four sentences Fluently in English, uh, in the city of Tianjin, may, maybe one in a thousand. You can find them, but it's it's quite difficult. Um, and the, the 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 standard of English spoken in China is still very low. Unfortunately, they're working at it. The the people and the government are working hard at it, but it, it, they got a billion and a half people to to teach English to. Uh, that takes a whole lot of time. So uh, the, the level at which. Uh, an English language professor from the university is at, and I've spoken with such people in China, is about the level of an Israeli high school graduate who speaks English. So, to, so that that ain't too high, yeah, and and that's a professor. So you land there, and everything is different. Every single thing you see, you experience, the food incredibly different it's not even like the chinese food you eat at chinese restaurants because people don't, maybe not know this but chinese food that we think of in the west usually more often than not it's chinese american food it's chinese food oh first of all usually from southern china because china only opened up fully to the west uh and gradually during the 1980s and the early 1990s and that means most of the chinese folks that people were encountering in for instance the europe or the united states were immigrants from um southern china and places like hong kong which are more open uh or taiwan and so you're used to southern chinese cuisine and southern chinese dialects when you hear them and which sound very different to what you encounter in northern china and the, the mandarin which is the, the prominent dialect today in china and then the food, what they did was in the United States, they mixed their native cuisines with uh, the American taste buds because they had to sell that food to Americans. And Americans uh, weren't so uh, fan, weren't so fond of that um, native Chinese cuisine, so they changed it a little. And now what you got is Chinese American cuisine. You get to China, it's very different. Um, the people, the way they behave. You go to the restroom. When I went to China on my trips, you you would still squat to do your stuff in a hole. Mm. Unless you're at an airport or a fancy hotel, you're going to have to squat and sit down. And even the eight-year-olds do it, which is a shock. And, and you know, it's dirty and it's not as um, hygienic or comfortable as what you're used to. Um, you you're at an airport you go off the plane you go through these detectors that detect if you have a flu 
that's crazy. They have machines you have to pass through, and then if you have a flu, they supposedly they detain you. That's crazy. So you and the, the entire airport, if if anyone had been to the airport in Beijing, which is the capital, they're now building a new one. So there's gonna be a, an even more impressive one soon. The entire airport has this dome. There's one roof covering the entire airport. And, and it's just very impressive and, and very different. The smells are different. Every, culture is everywhere in China, which is also different. So in, in the United States, you, you go through a city. So maybe you see a sculpture here and there. Maybe there's an art museum. In China, you set foot out the plane and everywhere there is art. If there is gardening at the airport or uh, in the city, which which is also everywhere, then every small tree is a bonsai tree. So, which are, bonsai are just regular trees which are kept small and trimmed in an artistic fashion. So, people think that uh, you buy special seeds. No, it's regular trees just kept small and and um, trimmed artistically over many years. But every single small tree in the city is is well trimmed and often in, in various interesting shapes. And they have statues everywhere and, and images and murals that the airport and the train stations, they have huge murals and they'd have these massive tree logs which they carved into um, hundreds and thousands of tiny sculptures of people uh, in a village or something. And there's music everywhere and, and you, you, get to the, you get to the street and you see people playing, which is very unusual. I mean, in the West, we forgot about play. When we become adults, we don't play as much anymore. In China, after 5 or 6 p.m., people just are already home from work, and they go out in the street and they play. They just they just play with each other, whatever. It could be uh, chess checkers. Uh, just uh, you know, tennis even on the street, um, and the jumping rope, and and then in the early mornings they they do this also usually between um, four and seven a.m. They they wake up very early and they go to the park and they all play. They play martial arts. They play instruments. They sing. They dance. A lot of people dance. They have these giant yo-yos which they. Uh, move about in the air. They they have all of these skills. It's like an entire culture devoted to play and to art. And it's it's not new. It's something. It was even more impressive back in the day. It was suppressed to an extent by by the party for for a few decades, and now it's coming back. But they they all have what we call in Chinese gongfu. Gongfu is a skill, a high level of skill acquired through hard work. So essentially, almost, uh, probably over 95% of the Chinese population, at least that I've seen, they have at least one hobby, often more, that they've gone to, to a high level relative to, you know, a regular person who, who can do it or can just do it to a limited extent. And, and they go about on the street or in the park and they do it. And all of these things are very different. And when I was sit sitting across the world in Israel and reading about China, uh, th there was nothing about this. No one was telling me about this. Rather, my impression of China came from, you know, the classic texts, like the, the Tao Te Ching, often uh, mis mistakenly called the Tao Te Ching, and, and Zhuangzi, and the Confucian analects, the, the, the sayings of Confucius, and Buddhist texts, and things like that. And what, what comes across from these texts is that the Chinese are just so enlightened that this society is so special because these texts bring bring out the the best of people the mo the the highest virtues they talk about always being a good person there's nothing there it's not like the bible which is history mixed with values and here the the chinese classical texts they mostly talk about um, meditation enlightenment and how to be a better person and the the best type of society and the benevolent person, the benevolent ruler and stuff like that. And then you, you get a fantasy up in your head, especially that with movies and, and the stories you hear. And of course, we're all biased. So we hear the best stories. We, we all, always neglect, neglect to remember the worst. And before I came to China, I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to 
just travel there and see that I'm liking this so much. I'm going to come back and I'm just going to stay for a few years with uh, Master Joe. Just going to study with him for a few years. I'm telling you, within 24 hours of when I landed the first time in China, I realized to my dismay that this is not going to happen. I saw that <laughs> although I liked a lot about China, this was not enough to my liking to stay there for many years on end. Just not. It was too too far from what I was used to and what I was willing to tolerate. No, it's, it's, it's a wonderful country. It's just so very different to what we're used to. Uh, I think the, the most trivial things you can imagine, for instance, still in China, it's very diffi difficult to get your hands on chocolate, bread, and cheese. You just can't get chocolate, bread, and cheese. It's crazy, but they... they they don't traditionally consume these foods so much. They have them, but it's it's not frequent for them to, to consume such, such things. So they're not on sale. You can't find them anywhere. You go to a huge mall. No chocolate, breads of any kind, or cheese. And and that's incredible. And and for someone who likes, for instance, Italian cuisine, <laughs> that's just a culinary insult, right? Wow. So, you know, we're talking about context, kind of the things around martial arts. And one of the things that we don't talk about too often, either on this show or admittedly conversations I haven't had often with other martial artists, is the context from which the arts spring up. And these are things that can be quite relevant, especially if you're someone who is a fan of history or appreciates the history of their arts, which I know you are. Uh, listeners, some of you may know Sifu from his books, which we'll, we'll talk about as, as we wrap up, you know, we have a different format today, but I do still want to give him some time to talk about the, the things that he's done because they're, they're amazing. Um, but how, hmm, how do I want to ask this? How important is it for you as a martial artist to understand the culture and the heritage of from where your martial arts came? I think this is extremely important. In a way, you're already doing this. Anyone who's practicing traditional martial arts is doing this by just going through the motions. Because you're literally walking in the footsteps of your martial ancestors. That's exactly what you're doing. They have laid out their footsteps for you that's the, the the steps and the stances and the movements and you just walk through them so you you take a walk through the forest of their mind you take a walk through through their manner of thinking you you take a walk through their life for their personal development and through that your body and your mind intuitively understand where did these people come from what what were were they about and if you do this long enough for, for many years, for decades even, then you come to embody that person which predated you in your martial arts lineage. That's part of the power and strength of traditional martial arts because you maintain a continuity. Of course, traditional martial arts should evolve and change with every single teacher who's worthy of teaching. But still, because there is this continuity, then there is a living core within the art that is passed on for, from one generation to another. That being said, you will never fully comprehend, not even at 30%, what these people, your martial ancestor has, ancestors had truly meant, unless you study their culture deeply. To study their culture, it's important to engulf yourself in that culture the best way possible is to live where they lived and, and eat what they did and smell what they smelled and, and be with the kind of society that they had been with that's not always feasible it's just the best way you can do it it doesn't mean that's the only way another way which is very important is to pursue a scholarly study of not just the martial art but the culture that surrounds it so these people they don't just come with these motions and these training methods and these movements and these abilities for power generation and rooting and, and building up their so-called internal power and their structure uh, 
out of thin air. They have inherited a lot of it from their martial ancestors, but they're also very much influenced by the culture they live in. And if we're talking about Chinese people, then they are influenced by uh, three schools of thought, primarily. And these are Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. Now, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, um, they work together in China, nowadays at least. Um, each fills in a, um, a niche in Chinese culture. So Buddhism deals with individual psychology. So the concept of Buddha, the Buddha was a, a person, a historical person, but the word Buddha means just the, the enlightened one. Okay, so the Buddhism deals with how do I enlighten myself? A person that, I mean, not a lot of people become enlightened, but just be more enlightened, relatively speaking, than you were a day ago or, or 10 years ago. That's good enough. But that pertains to a person working with himself, you know? And uh, how do I improve? How do I uh, avoid illusions? That's a big thing in, in Buddhism. So there are illusions in society. We tell ourselves all sorts of lies and things like that. And society creates an image for us of reality, which is not the true image. So how do I work on myself, for, for instance, meditation or martial arts practice, to get into the source, to, to find what the, in, Buddhist, in Zen Buddhism is called um, the manner in which I looked before I was born. Not to mean how I looked when I was a fetus, but how did I look before I was born in the sense of how did I look before society poured its ideas into me? So that's in, in, that's, uh, in individual psychology with Buddhism. Then Confucianism deals with sociology. Confucius uh, was about how do we create a proper society where people respect each other, where um, people can agree upon the rules and preferably with um, f as few rules as possible because in a just and benevolent society, we don't need as many rules because pe people just behave. They, they don't need to be told, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. It's just a more upright society. And an upright society, according to Confucius, uh, is uh, being maintained and created through having upright people. Confucius calls, calls this concept the Junze. Junze is the, the gentleman, the virtuous person, the benevolent person. So if every single one of us in society is benevolent, then all of society becomes benevolent and virtuous. And he also says if the, if the leaders are, are virtuous and benevolent, then the people would also like to be the same. And if the people are so, then through the people would rise virtuous and benevolent leaders. So you see, he talks about society rather than individual psychology. And he also talks about doing. Yeah, how do I change the, the practical stuff in everyday reality, not the shape or the, the, um, the thinking within my own mind. So that's different. And then you got Taoism, and Taoism deals with uh, so-called met metaphysics. Taoism deals with uh, the relationship between man and the universe. So Taoism asks, what, what are the guiding principles of the universe? It's like dealing with, and many compare Taoism nowadays to quantum mechanics. Um, if I can understand how things work, what are the guiding principles of things? Then I can understand how everything works. And, 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 and for this, you don't really need learning. You need understanding. So Confucius tells you, Oh, you need to study a lot of books. You need to be uh, very scholarly and highly educated. Then the Buddha tells you, you need to uh, dig very deep into your own mind, into the minds and hearts of other people. And you need to really understand the human psyche. And then Taoism says, oh, it's all nonsense. You know, if you understand how the universe works, then you can understand how people work and how everything, how gardening works, how martial arts work. And then from through Taoism, we get things like the five elements called the wishing in Chinese, which is a system of explaining uh, five changes going in, in a circle and manner from one to another. And also the, the relationships between them, some create one another, some destroy or interfere with one another. That's used uh, very heavily in traditional Chinese medicine. And also, um, 
and Taiji. Taiji is the symbol containing yin and yang, the two fish so-called chasing each other, the white, white dot within the black, the black dot within the white. So yin and yang and the, the five elements are basic tenets of Taoism. And it's about, what are these things about? I mean, yin and yang is about how the universe works. So you got male and female, high and low, uh, inside and outside, uh, strong and weak, night and day. So if you understand these sorts of relationships, you can understand a lot. So if you are a traditional Chinese martial artist, you have to understand these things. You got to understand basic tenets of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism to figure out what these people had probably meant. So to give a practical example now, if I um, make a move with someone else in important practice, I have to be aware of where's the yin and yang in that. So if we're doing um, so-called so exercise uh, push hands, yeah, it's very common in Tai Chi Chuan and many uh, traditional Chinese martial arts. And in the ba very basic variation, we just stand in front of each other and we push each other's hands back and forth in a circle. I push towards the other person's chest, then he diverts, he pushes towards me, I divert, and we go in the circle with our hands, pushing against one another, trying to not use too much power, just be soft and uh, flow with, with each other, while still maintaining our structure and, and, and keeping our uh, routine. So uh, an equivalent practice in Okinawan Karate would be Kake practice, right? The one where you go back and forth with your hands, very similar. Mm -hmm. So when you do this sort of practice, uh, when my palm faces towards my partner, palm faces towards the partner, then my palm is young. Okay, young, it's male, it's more aggressive. Okay, and it's trying to get at him. When my palm faces towards me, this is yin. So it's more feminine, it's more yielding, right? Right. So what I want to do in, in that sort of movement, I want to create a balance between yin and yang. If the person is coming at me with yang, so there's someone standing in front of me and he pushes against my hand and his palm is facing me. So his palm towards me. If I put my palm facing against him, so my palm faces him, his palm faces me, then this creates a scenario of strength against strength, right? We're kind of clashing. However, if I turn my palm towards me, my palm is towards me, his palm is also towards me. So my palm is yin, facing towards me, and his palm is yang, is facing away from him. I use my yin to divert his yang, and that's more effective and takes less effort, especially in a circular manner, to absorb his movement so I can come back at him. And it's not just in yang, because the palm it doesn't just flip to one side and the other side in a moment, but I continuously rotate the palm back and forth towards him and towards me and continuously keep rotating it throughout the movement. The more young he is, the more yin I am. The more young I am, the more yin he is. This is um, Taoist-influenced movement relationship. And this exists within the traditional Chinese martial arts to a very prominent degree, especially in the internal martial arts of China. And this is a basic tenet of Taoism, which I teach in actual movement to beginners, oftentimes during their first class. If you understand this, then you have much better instruments for uh, comprehending what your martial ancestors had meant. Nice. As you're talking about those three philosophies, I was kind of struck that to be a complete martial artist, I want to look at what I'm doing. And, and I don't know if you had this intention, but I want to look at my training, my practice, the techniques that I'm doing through all of those lenses, through the Taoist lens, through the, the Buddhist lens. Because I think it gives me different insight into not only how I would practice, but how I would apply and how I would develop as a martial artist. And, and that wasn't, you know, this is a thought that is new to me, so it, it's a little unformed, but I, I like having those doors open. So that's pretty cool. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. And I think each of them fits in in a different spot 
on your martial arts training and curriculum. So, for instance, I just gave an example of how Taoism would be applied to an actual movement practice. Maybe Buddhism is something you'd like to work on when you work on meditation. Because Buddhism asks the difficult questions about who you are. And that's something that maybe that's difficult to get into while you're, you're trying to hit somebody or defend yourself. But it's very a very good paradigm to use in meditation. And then, if, for instance, if you manage to reach a very important conclusion about your life and who you are through meditation, then that inevitably helps your martial arts. Because if you're lost, if you don't know who you are, you're, you're going to be a stiffer person. That's just a fact. If you're at ease with yourself, if you have more self-respect, self-esteem, things like that, then you're going to have an easier time to relax, to breathe better, um, and then your movement improves, even though that came from your mind. So that comes from, for instance, meditation training. So you use the Buddhism for meditation, then Taoism you use in actual movement, and the Confucianism you can use to... Uh, better manage a martial, art co a martial arts community. So, Confucianism talks of virtues. Uh, who is a benevolent person? Uh, who is worthy of being a leader, of teaching? For instance, uh, Confucius said that the person worthy of being a leader uh, is one who continuously goes back to the materials he had already studied to be able to extract even more from them. And that's very wise because what we do often, we we have videos of our teachers, we watch that video once, then we forget about it for 20 years. Or we, we read a very, very important book, not just any book, but a, a book that's fundamental for our understanding of the world or of martial arts, then we just forget it exists for the next 30 years. But actually, if you go back to these things in a year or two, or maybe after even six months, then because of your new, renewed understanding of the world and of your martial arts, you'd be able to extract more from these things. And a person who does this can become a, a far better teacher. So I think one of the roles we have as teachers is to go back and revisit and review the stuff that we think we already know to extract more from them. And that's known, you know this, and I know this, and all everyone who's been teaching for a while knows this, that once you begin teaching, then you actually learn more by teaching often than you, you had learned from your own teacher. Because by teaching the art, you can get more. Because you review what you thought you already knew. But when you teach it to others, and you review it again and again and again, then you can extract more from it. So that's one example. Another example is... And just uh, creating the proper relationship and hierarchy between people at your martial arts academy. So in, in Japanese and Okinawan martial arts, that can be maybe by belt rank. In Chinese martial arts, that's more akin to a family relationship. So you got a, the teacher in, in a very traditional martial arts school like mine, and the, the teacher is like a father figure. And then the students, initially, they're more like customers, but they're still treated like family friends uh and then later on throughout the years when they get closer and like once he's developed teacher can trust you more then the teacher may accept you as a, in an enter the gate ceremony uh, to be a disciple once you're a disciple it's like you're the adopted son of the teacher so you become family and and this all sets the correct types of relationships within those types of traditions and schools and martial arts and that keeps the entire school in line because everyone knows their place and what happens at an mma school or krav maga school oftentimes you want realism okay you got it but part of realism is everyone challenges everyone else and you get people challenging their teachers people challenging their, each other in the name of truth people step out out of line they cross social boundaries uh, and the community is very easily disturbed. And then what happens, you know, every few years, uh, someone steps out of the school, um, creates his own organization or his own martial art or his own thing, and then there is no tradition. If there is no tradition, you can't learn from tradition. So you have to recreate everything anew, and no one is wise enough to create everything anew in, in a single generation. So there we go. This is the reason we have traditional martial arts, part of 
tradition is having social harmony and a community and you need to have that sort of community if you want to have tradition otherwise just a bunch of folks having fun coming to train fighting each other all right but um that's not necessarily a community let's take a step aside now i i said earlier i wanted to make sure that folks had a chance to know about your writing and and some of the things that you've accomplished you, you've put together some wonderful stuff over the years and you know listeners that sometimes we get folks on the show who i knew about quite a while ago and and this is one of those cases so this has been a lot of fun for me uh Talk to the listeners about your books and, and the other things that you've done and where they might be able to find them. Sure. So uh, I've authored four books thus far, one in Hebrew and three in English. Uh, my Hebrew book is an interesting project. It's free for download. So if you can read Hebrew, you can go on our website. That's tianjin.co.il. That's uh, T-I-A-N-J-I-N.co.il. And the website is in Hebrew. And there on the book section, there is a link to the book uh, that's directly to my Dropbox. And this is uh, maybe 420, 430 page book in Hebrew about the martial arts. And the reason, that, and, and I keep updating this book, it's, it's alive. It's not something I published and then I, I let be. Um, it's like a blog in the form of a book. It has chapters, it has table of contents. It's very structured, but it's somewhere in between a book and a blog. I, I don't know that anyone had done anything similar in the martial arts. And this book is about, contains a lot of chapters and articles about traditional Chinese culture and Chinese martial arts and martial arts in general, and even uh, Chinese history of the martial arts and philosophy. And I wrote this book essentially because I got tired of going through the same lectures over and over again with my students. So every time at the end of class, I would talk for five, 10, sometimes 40 minutes. And, and I began to sound like a broken record. And, and I thought, oh my God, I can't do this. And people have to go home also. So instead, I just put this in book format, all of these lectures that I want to provide for my students for free. And they can go online and just read it, download it to their computer. It's very convenient. And it helped raise the scholarly standard at our academy. So I told my students, there, there is no way that I'm going to let you be ignorant. There, there are just too many martial arts students who come to class once, twice, three times a week, and then they read nothing. And 30 years later, they don't know anything beyond what their teacher said in class. And I think that that's very bad. That if, if it's like this, they're never going to understand their martial arts in, in, seriously. So... Um, after they're done with this book of mine, I tell them we have a large library at our academy. You have other venues for acquiring knowledge. There are other books that I've written. Go read something. Go watch something. Maybe after a few years, go start visiting some other school. See what they're about. Go expand your horizons because if you only listen to me, then you're not going to get anywhere. I'm, I'm giving you a lot, but I, I ain't got no monopoly over truth. No one has. So you have to learn from other people as well, from their writings, from their videos, maybe from their classes, if you'd like. If, if you've studied long enough, you, you can also go try do something else. Um, and I'm not a dictator in that respect. I think that uh, either you, you begin studying another martial art with me, if you'd like, or you go study another style. That's all good. If the teacher is good and capable and worthy, then go for it. And I'd even recommend people if you'd like to. So that's my book in Hebrew. My books in English um, are published on Amazon. Um, one is sort of a cross between a book and a booklet, which covers a self-defense system for women, which I've co-authored with my sovereign Nati Sifu, Sapir Tal. Um, so that might not be an interest for most listeners, but if you're still interested, it's called uh, Spiky, Your Age in Self-Defense. Spiky is like the word spike with a Y at the end. Spiky, your edge in self-defense. That's on Amazon. The other two books, uh, which are of much greater interest to our listeners, most probably, are Research of Martial Arts and The Martial Arts Teacher. Now, these are uh, works that I have uh, given a lot of thought to. Uh, what I would like to provide people with my books 
is something that would, would be worth the time, worth, it, worth their money, would give them serious knowledge and information. Um, you, you've, you've probably, Jeremy, you've had the experience of reading books by very good martial artists who are not as good at, at putting what they know in writing. So you end up reading yeah. 300 pages <laughs> and then there are maybe 30 really, really, really good pages. But then the rest is just like, ah, you just got to sift for the rest to get to the good stuff. I don't, I don't usually spend much time sifting. If a book doesn't grab me, if I'm not feeling like this is a... a... For me to read a martial arts book, it has to be at least as good for my martial arts as training would be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm just going to go train. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a fast reader and I'm an author myself. And in order to be a better author, I've I've sifted through hundreds of books yeah, sure. uh, to 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 just get the vibe of what other people are up to their 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 ideas. And I truly believe there are many many good books where there are just a few really good ideas covered by hundreds of pages of maybe not so good ideas or at times just talking about their life or other things which are might be irrelevant. So my books aren't like this. In my books, I'm trying to convey really good information from the get-go with every single page you turn ought to be something to be learned or to be used. So it has to be either uh, interesting or actually technically useful for you in your training or your uh, teaching. So Research of Martial Arts is a book about the theory of martial arts. It explains, it's like, um, you know, in physics, they work at a unifying theory. They're trying to come up with something that would explain how, how all of physics works together, Newtonian physics with quantum physics and everything together. And it's very difficult to do because you're trying to bring together several different languages. So we have the same thing in martial arts. Um, we all come from different cultures, different lineages, different languages we speak. So the research of martial arts tries to m do some order in this, m make some order and um, bring together the theories and ideas from many different martial arts and explain what they really mean, how they're similar, how they're different. And especially research of martial arts explains what the internal martial arts of China mean. What are they about? What do, what what is structure? What is qi? What, when you generate explosive power, what, what is meant by that in these internal martial arts? What makes, and there is no agreement whatsoever, you know, if you, if you go online or read in books, of what internal power is, or how you generate it, or uh, if there is even one type of internal power, which there isn't. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing, because we've got so many different lineages, methods, styles. So uh, my, my thesis in this book, Internal Power, is many things combined, and I explain what these things are for practical examples and stories and training methods. And my books are by no means manuals. They are geared towards and being read by people who already train, who have trained for a while, and they want to understand their martial arts better. So uh, research of martial arts is about that. It also includes many interviews with prominent masters uh, of the Chinese intel, internal martial arts and others, uh, which are fascinating uh, in their own right. And it's just a, a most interesting book, <laughs> even though I'm biased, of course. But you can go on Amazon and read the reviews for research martial, art, uh, martial arts and you would see for yourself. Then The Martial Arts Teacher um, is a book I've written from my perspective as a martial arts teacher, trying to convey what teaching is about for me and what teaching is about in the traditional Chinese sense. So things like guanxi that I just explained uh, on this podcast interview, this is something that seldom explained in the traditional Chinese martial arts, even though it's there, and it's it's deeply embedded in that sort of uh, tradition and culture. So a lot of things like that. What what does it mean to be a shufu or sifu in, in Cantonese, a traditional Chinese martial arts teacher? How do you create a virtuous, benevolent, positive, happy community of cooperative students? How do you keep those students? How, how can you convey traditional teaching of any martial art, not just uh, traditional Chinese martial arts, to children and adolescents? Um, what do you do when the challenges of everyday life and our modern reality that we live in tackle your traditional mindset and methods? Um, how do you bring people into a state where they are 
your friends, but they aren't too close also because you cannot afford a student being your friend you know, completely because there is some distance. Otherwise, you cannot be his teacher. As uh, we teachers know, it's nearly impossible to teach your own family members. It's usually very difficult because the, if the closest people to you are very difficult to teach for various reasons I won't get into right now. So you want to bring your students gradually over years and years closer to you, but you also cannot afford to have them be like, you know, your spouse. Or speaking of which, how do you deal with, if you're a male teacher, how do you deal with female students? How do you prevent uh, sexual harassment, abuse? Uh, how do you deal with other teachers who might do such things? Uh, how do you deal with the naysayers, with politics and the martial arts? As a teacher, as someone who, who aspires to be above this, um, all of this and much more, and relating all of this to traditional Chinese culture and history, this is all in The Martial Arts Teacher, which is a book very different to other books uh, about how to teach the martial arts. Because I've, I've read quite a few books by other authors um, on this topic, and most of them, some of them really excellent books, they deal with uh, the technicalities. They tell you, oh, this is how you follow advertising leads, this is how you get more students, this is how you sell uh, those uniforms for more money, uh, you, you throw kids' pizza parties at your karate dojo, stuff like that. All of this you will not find in my book. My book is about the essence of maintaining, creating, supporting a healthy traditional martial arts community and not about how to gain a buck. Uh, I, I do have some um, marketing and, and money stuff in there also, but that's hardly the main point. That makes for maybe 5% of the book. So it's different. My writing altogether is different. Um, I represent something that's um, a bit out of the ordinary because I have a, a very eclectic background. I'm Jewish, I'm Israeli, I study traditional Chinese martial arts. I spent a lot of time also in Europe and the United States. I have uh, a degree in law and degree in government studies. I come from a family of lawyers. I actually, um, I spent three years of my life as an investigator for the Israeli police force. This was my uh, obligatory service in Israel. Uh, men have to serve for three years, so instead of serving in the army, I served mostly in the Israeli police force as an investigator and been to China for a long while. So all of these experiences combined have created a sort of um, living philosophy and teaching philosophy, uh, which are quite different to those presented by other people. And it's just uh, the kind of life I've had, the kind of conclusions I've arrived to. And I hope that you would also enjoy what I have to share. Because after all, this book was written to, to the benefit of those who might read it. And as I said about research of martial arts, you're welcome to look up uh, the martial arts teacher on any Amazon affiliated website and just check the reviews, see what people have to say about it and see for yourself. Absolutely. And of course, listeners, we're going to have links to this as we always do to social media websites, all the things that we've talked about today over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And Sifu, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, you know, this, uh, okay. this was great. I would like to add just uh, one thing we, we, we haven't tackled. I, I think this is very important. A lot of people have a fantasy of their mind of going to study at some monastery with this bearded master, as, as in a Kill Bill movie or a Shaolin movie or something. But actually, uh, people ought to know that throughout the Orient, most of the serious masters of the martial arts are everyday people. They are hidden in plain sight. They oftentimes live in cities, not even villages or, or monasteries. Um, many of them will not charge large sums of money at all. And doesn't mean they're no good. Um, they don't just don't have that sort of um, financial mindset that, that you'd have in a place like the United States. They have a day job and maybe they don't teach for money at all maybe they don't charge a lot because um they're looking for good students they're not looking to get rich for them it's a part of their culture it's like uh you go to a rabbi and 
you think the rabbi that charges you a million bucks to teach you the Old Testament is the best rabbi? No, actually, you know, the best rabbis are often those who teach you for free because they just want to teach you what they know. Because for them, it's it's a cultural thing. It's a, it's also a religious thing for them. It's not it's not a venue for making money. So do not be uh, solely attracted to to this fantasy of arriving at a mountaintop, studying with that bearded master. Oftentimes, more often than not, that's just a fantasy. And these are not the best teachers to study with. And actually, if you do your research, you would discover that places like Wudang and Shaolin nowadays, where there are temples and they do teach the martial arts, they, I, I won't get political here, but they're not the best places to learn. And, and, and the best teachers aren't there due to various historical reasons. You do your research, you get to someone who can share his, his or her experiences and give you very important letter of recommendations or, or letter of recommendation or even take you physically to see their teacher, that would be the best way and really look into it. If you're going to spend some time learning something abroad, then you might end up practicing that stuff for the rest of your life. And if not the rest of your life, maybe just just 10, five years, three years, maybe a year. That's still a whole lot of time, a lot of effort and money you're gonna put into it. Be absolutely certain that's what you're interested in. Not because you saw it on YouTube, not because someone told you, because you felt it and that's what you wanna do. And also, yes, go, go and see several teachers. Don't just stick with the, the first person you, you found because it's like a romantic relationship. Sometimes the first person you ever date becomes your spouse and you're happily ever after. More often than not, if you marry the first person you date, uh, you're going to be miserable because you haven't done your research. You haven't seen what other people have to offer. Gain a perspective and then you'll be more likely to be successful. Thank you, Sifu Bluestein, for sharing your experience about culture and training in China. Your perspective on training overseas is incredibly valuable, especially to those of us who have been dying to do it. I appreciate your time, your books, and your wisdom. If you want to check out the show notes, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find photos, videos, all the other episodes. It's all available for free. I just want to help you build context around this episode and maybe add some depth to your martial arts lifestyle. While you're over there, sign up for the newsletter. We've always got a new episode, not episode, another issue, edition, whatever you want to call it. We have another round of that newsletter coming soon. We won't spam you. We send one or two a month. That's it. Just let you know what's going on. Maybe throw you a discount or two. You can follow Whistlekick on social media at Whistlekick. We're super creative with the way we name things. And of course, find the hub for Whistlekick online at whistlekick.com. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.